Good. Uh, <laughs> should we go back a little bit? You're right at the top of the, the thing. Is that better? Yeah, we under. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, well, actually, the light's coming from all over the place. Yeah, there. As a photographer, we've got so many cross shadows, we'll just have to work it. Yeah, just to, It's what we say, not what we look like. So, <laughs> so just a short, uh, like, five minutes. Sure. Nobody listens to anything more than that, the attention span. Of five minutes is already good, but yeah. yeah or even uh, shorter than that. Um, hello, Nick. Hello there. Uh, so I've come to see your exhibition with your new NFT collection. Yeah. Do you want to tell me a little bit about it? Yes, um, it started two years ago. Um, it was a way of working, um, trying to do something new in fashion. I was getting increasingly concerned about how fashion is bad for the planet and how it's not going anywhere. And I'm not very keen on um, the whole of the kind of, you know, uh, if you want the market forces leading creativity. So it's not that I'm a communist, but I'm not particularly into capitalism, shall we say. Um, and I think that art should be made for the love of it, and I think art should be made for expression and not just to make profit. So I understand where we fit into all of that. Anyway, long story short, I came across, through my working with colleges, I came across a generation of digital-only fashion designers who I thought were fascinating. This was probably about three years ago. And I wasn't sure at that time what they were going to do with their digital-only fashion. Um, however, about two years ago, as we all know, there was a sort of big boom in the whole NFT idea. Um, and so we got caught up in the energy of that and decided to do a collection um, which shows 30 new uh, digital uh, fashion designers. And we wanted a central figure to hang this on. And I'd worked with a, a person, um, a model in New York called Giselle, who goes under the Instagram handle of Ugly Worldwide. And uh, I just thought they were particularly interesting because they're not a conventional model. They have uh, the ability to create their own imagery, which they do very well. And they, they frequently change identity or ch frequently change um, their, their visual appearance. And they're very masterful at that. Uh, I just think they're one of those generation of people who express themselves through Instagram and similar platforms to show their world. They don't need you know, outside help from photographers or, or um, you know, advertising agencies or brands or catwalks or anything. I think there's a whole generation of people doing that, creating you want their own image and creating their own world. Um, so I was very interested, so I approached Giselle, who I'd worked with in any case, and said to them, would they want to be the center of this? So Giselle is the center, which means that they're the person that's wearing all the digital fashion. And then I worked with somebody who I've known for a long time, who actually used to be my conventional retoucher. So when I was doing campaigns for Christian Dior and for Lancome back in the 1990s, they would do the cosmetic retouching um, and sort of you know, beautify all that sort of stuff. Um, so I asked and Tom, oh, so they stopped being my conventional retoucher. And they'd gone off to California to learn CGI. So they were very up on um, uh, uh, avatar creation and uh, making virtual spaces and all that sort of thing. So we worked together and created this collection, which is 8,000 pieces, which is a huge collection. But when you put together um, the 30 different fashion design, digital fashion designers, then we got different hair pieces made by a very good, uh, uh, I think one of the best in the world, hairdressers called Eugene Solomon, who works with people like Calvin Klein and uh, Marcella and Dior and all these different well-known brands. Um, and they, they're somebody who is very tactile, and we were speaking a minute ago about how it's so important to feel some sort of touch by the hand of the artist. And if we can reproach anything to digital, digital art, it's, it can feel a bit remote, and it can feel a little bit soulless. So I, was very, I very much wanted to show that wasn't always the case. So we got Eugene to come into the studio and create headpieces out of things like eucalyptus bark, or robin feathers, or honey, or melting wax, or all these so physical things, much as you would do kind of, you know, to actually make sculptures. And then we 3D scan those and put those on the avatar of Giselle. Um, so there's lots of different traits, and we created different body types and um, different skin textures, some based on old chinoiserie, some based on, on sort of 17th century porcelain. So they're quite, you know, they have a lot of history to them as well. I think that's also really important is that we use the past to create the future as well, rather than just sort of ignoring it um, or wallowing around in it either. I don't want to sort of um, you know, just spend my whole time looking over my shoulder and looking back to the past. But I think it's important. There's been some incredible things made, and I think we should use that to you know, help us sort of in some way deal with the future. We are creating a new civilization or a new 
uh, a new culture, shall we say, less, less pompously. Um, so I think it's important that it, you know, it has real value to it, real aesthetic value to it, which means it needs to have depth and soul and culture and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I do think with digital fashion or digital creativity, if you're from a place where you've had a lot of materials as, as part yeah. of your process, and yeah. it seems that within fashion it is very process-driven, which is fun. It's part of the R and D, and you know, fashion yeah. is a communication tool. Ultimately, yeah. it's yeah. narrative. It creates uh, the culture and bridges, uh, yeah, ma many genres and eras, as as you, as you mentioned, but sort of propels it forward. Uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that the the NFT market mm. um, is being actually disrupted by yeah. by the the fashion crowd at the moment. Good, I'm glad you see it that way. <laughs> or I hoped you would, but I'm not sure everybody shares that opinion. But I guess I guess the other thing you're saying about your your model, Giselle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this whole it's, it's a real empowerment of it's not really individuality, but it's there are no more gatekeepers. Hmm. There's no one to say Giselle can't do this or do that. She no, can just create. No, no, no. Um, well, just just to give you a little bit of history on Giselle. I first came on, I came across her on Instagram probably about six years ago, and they were at a model agency in Chicago doing some modeling part-time, and they shaved off their eyebrows, and the model agency said, as middle America might do, um, you'll never work again, we can't use you if you've got no eyebrows, you know, get out of here. Um, and so Giselle went to New York, shaved the head, um, and then I saw them on Instagram with a head freshly shaved, I thought, amazing. And I had a job to do for Comme des Garçons, so I got Giselle over. She, they modeled uh, Comme des Garçons for me. But the important, you mentioned that they're a model. The, one of the things that I think is important in this project is that we've given them authorship of their own image. So we've got them involved, in, they, they create the makeup looks, they create how their face is, they've been involved in every part of this, right from the 3D scan onwards. Models traditionally are referred to as a blank canvas, yes. which I think is slightly demeaning to people to refer Absolutely. to them as a blank canvas, but they are traditionally, and without too much implied criticism, they are the recipient of the photographer's fantasies, the designer's fantasies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think in this project for Icon One, we've put Giselle right back in the middle of the creation part. So they are responsible with us for how they look and how that they you know, want to appear and all those sorts of things. So I did want their input into that, and I did want them to be at the center of this. No, I, yeah, that's, I, I, it's really easy to criticize the fashion industry because it's yeah. such an old industry. Yeah. So it's a legacy industry. Yeah, um, and it hasn't changed for years. I mean, that's the sort of strange thing that an industry which is based on future desires, so yeah. it's sort of predictive, uh, you know, it predicts our desires arguably six months or a year ahead, but that is, this is actually very hard to make it change. Um, and it is slightly a, a slow adopter to things like NFTs or to, you know, avatars or to virtual reality. Or it doesn't sort of get there very easily. And it's because it needs to change. And of course, it's a very, because it is quite a traditional industry, weirdly, it's actually quite established in its sort of way it does things. So it does things with a catwalk show in one of the three or four major capitals. And then with a sort of, you know, the buyers buying that, then the photographers working with the magazines to promote that, which comes out three or four months later. That's all, that's the model that they work to. However, since, you know, about 10 years ago, things haven't been the same. Yeah. You know, once shows, just once, sorry, once um, the catwalks are live and you can see on the moment the model sets, step onto the, onto the catwalk, the public can see them, then they want that desire then. That completely disrupts the whole of that industry. But now it's, I'm, I'm a very firm believer that that, that is a, a redundant model. It's not even fashionable yeah, anymore. It's, it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary, yeah. not yeah. fashionable, not sustainable, and actually not what people want to see. Yeah, complete agreement. Um, Good. Thank you. Nick. My pleasure. Nice to speak to you. Lovely to speak to you too. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs>